morning. This is Pastor Corey here, and I am so glad that you have joined us right here on Facebook Live. The RBC Praise Team has a great morning of worship music coming your way, and I cannot wait to dive into God's Word with you with a new message that is sure to help you in your daily walk with Christ. Stay connected with Riverdale 24-7 right here on Facebook and on our website, rbcflint.org. Thank you for spending part of your Sunday with Riverdale. Our morning worship celebration begins in just a few minutes. That sounded refreshing, whoever just opened that. Um, Thank you, Matt and praise team for another week leading us in worship. You know, I, um, I just have to say before we get started, um, I just love um, our volunteers who serve week in and week out from our praise team to the people in the sound booth to those teaching the children and those that greet and do security. I mean, these, these men and women, they have full-time jobs and yet they come and they, they freely give their time and their talent and, uh, and so you guys encourage me so much, and I love, love, love you. Um, I don't know about any of you. I, I pray this is true, but I've had just such a good, good weekend. Uh, my, uh, my oldest brother, David, uh, flew in from Florida on Friday. I haven't seen my brother in over a year, and so we've just had such a good time connecting together, sharing what God's doing in our lives, and uh, here's the thing about my oldest brother, and he would um, really not like me to say this, but he's very talented um, musically, and, uh, and so I asked him if he would be willing to, to sing for us while he's here. I mean, I just put him to work, right? And, uh, and uh, if he'd be willing to close our service uh, singing a song and then leading us in worship and uh, my brother said, absolutely. I mean, he's got these gifts and he's surrendered them to the Lord. And so I'm, I'm so excited for this. I haven't heard him sing in a long time. And so I grew up listening to this. And so um, I'm really looking forward to it. I know it'll be encouragement to all of you. Um, so that's at the end of the service for right now. Uh, you got to listen to me for um, a few minutes. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can open yours to Acts 27. Acts chapter 27, okay, we have been now two years in this book, uh, going through it verse by verse, and where we left off last time, Paul and his traveling companions uh, were fighting a storm on the Mediterranean Sea as they were attempting to sail to Rome. Uh, Verse 14 tells us that a tempestuous wind called the Nor'easter struck down. This storm hit as Paul and the crew were attempting to sail around the island of Crete. Paul had advised them not to sail, but to wait out the winter where they were already docked at this place called Fair Havens at the, on the island of Crete, but the captain and the crew didn't listen. And so they're out on the water when the nor'easter hits, and the storm uh, pushes them about 25 miles southwest to a small island named Clauda. And uh, they attempted to drop their anchors at Clauda, but the storm kept pushing their boat further and further south. Verse 15 says that the ship could not face the wind, and they gave way to it and were being driven along. And the further south the wind blew them, the closer they got to the African coastline, and there was an infamous sandbar on the African coastline called the Sirtis, where many ships ran aground and were destroyed. The Sirtis was a ship graveyard. And so all on board Paul's boat were were freaking out. Verse 20 says that all hope of their being saved was at last abandoned. This is it. This is the end. It's all over. You know, storms can have that kind of effect on us, especially if they they hang around. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe your storm is a financial crisis. You've been struggling to get by, struggling to make ends meet for years. Maybe your storm is a health crisis. You've been chronically ill, suffering day in and day out for decades. Maybe your storm is more of a relational crisis. 
You know, you have longed for reconciliation in a certain relationship only to see it continue to lay in ruins. Maybe your storm is an emotional crisis. I mean, we see a lot of that going on right now with the virus and the isolation it's brought, with the election and the division it's caused. Maybe you're discouraged and depressed. And and so, guys, whether your storm is financial, physical, relational, emotional, if it's prolonged, you can start to think like Paul's companions thought. This is it. This is the end. It's all over. It'll never get better. I wonder if anybody here this morning has reached that point. Like, I don't, I don't know where all of you are at, but, but God knows. God sees where you're at, and he is with you. He's got promises for you, promises you can put your full weight down on, and they will hold you up. Last week, we saw how God sent an angel to Paul right there on the boat and assured him, Paul, you must go to Rome. You are not going to die on this sea, in this storm, and all those who are with you, none of them will die on this sea, in this storm. God saw them in the storm. He knew what they needed, and God gave them a promise to get them through. You know, last week's sermon was all about what God gives us to weather our storm. And I said last week that that would have been a great time for me to read for you uh, that whole Footprints in the Sand poem. Remember that? I, guys, I looked up the poem this past week, and I was surprised to find out that it didn't rhyme. Okay, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. I prefer poems to rhyme. Uh, that's just me. But, but this is a good poem of what God does for us in a storm. So listen to this. Footprints in the Sand. By the way, let me just say, nobody knows who wrote this thing. At least a dozen people have taken credit for it. There's been fighting and even lawsuits. So it's it's crazy to think that there's all this scandal surrounding this poem that has brought so many comfort over the years. Which by saying that, I hope I didn't ruin it for you, okay? I mean, if you got it sewn on a doily hanging on your wall, that's okay. It's okay. It's a, it's, it's a good poem. It's a good poem. Even though it doesn't rhyme, it's a good poem. It goes like this. One night I dreamed a dream. I was walking along the beach with my Lord, and across the sky flashed scenes from my life. And for each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I followed you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the most difficult times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. And Lord, I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. My precious child, the Lord whispered, I love you, and I would never leave you during your trial and suffering. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. I mean, how many of you can look back over your life and say, uh, the only way I got through that was God had to carry me through? You know, if it wasn't for God, I would have never made it. Like, I have gone through things where all I could do was grab hold of God, and he literally pulled me through the storm. I can think of situations where the only explanation is, God, you did this, this is all you, you got me through this. However, when storms come, when when difficulty arrives, let me ask you, does God just want us to lay down and not get up until he comes and pick us up? Right. Does God just want us to hunker down near a storm shelter and he, until he tells us it's, it's okay to come out? What, what do you think? No, he doesn't. God, okay, God's going to do his part, but there's a little we have to do as well. And so that's why I like this other poem. I like it because, number one, it rhymes, and number two, it provides a good balance to the footprints poem. And we desperately need balance Don't we? I mean, we need balance. We cannot think, okay, God, I'm just going to hang out down here in my basement and let you do all the work. But we also cannot stick God out down in the basement and we try to do the work ourselves. Okay, we do what we can and God does what he does. I've, I've put it this way many times before. I do my best 
and then I just trust God for the rest. Okay, do your best. When a storm comes, do your best, and then trust God for the rest. Do everything you know to do, and God will do everything he desires to do. And so there's a poem that provides a proper balance to footprints in the sand. I have shared this poem from the pulpit more than once, and I'm going to do it again. And part of the reason is because I just like saying the title. It's called Butt Prints in the Sand. And uh, nobody knows who wrote this either. It's, you know, all kinds of people want to take credit for a title that clever. Butt Prints in the Sand. It goes like this. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen, the footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. Then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? These prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they are much too big for feet. My precious child, the Lord said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow. The walk of faith, you would not know. So I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. (laughs) Because in life, there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb. When one must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. (laughs) There comes a time when one must fight and one must climb. That reminds me of of Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 14. I brought this up a few weeks ago. In 1 Samuel 14, the Philistines had come to attack Israel. And the people of Israel were all overwhelmed at the size of the Philistine army, no one more so than King Saul. So Saul and the Israelites go into hiding. Saul's son, Jonathan, does not approve of his father's actions. And so Jonathan goes out on a little scouting trip, and he sees a detachment of Philistines camping out on a mountain. And this mountain, 1 Samuel 14, says that the front side of the mountain was called Bozes, which means slippery, and the back side of the mountain was called Senna, which means thorny. So the front was steep, the back was thorny. I mean, how easy was it going to be to get up this mountain? Not easy. And yet Jonathan says to his armor bearer, come, let's climb up to these Philistines. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Saul's in his cave, hiding out, quoting the footprints poem. Meanwhile, Jonathan's clawing up the mountain, quoting the butt prints poem. There comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand. What happened to Jonathan? He and his armor pair did their part. They climbed, they fought, they rose, they took a stand. And what did God do? God gave Jonathan victory over the 20 Philistines who were camped out on top of that mountain. Of course, that fired up the rest of the Israelites and they routed their enemy. Don't miss this. Jonathan said, let's go. Let's go. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. See, guys, our part is to go. Walk by faith. God's part is he will work for us. Nothing can hinder him from saving, whether by many or by few. But we still got to go. Guys, we still got to climb and fight. We still got to rise and stand. Let's not be like King Saul who left his butt prints in the sand. Okay, so the the question on the table this morning is, what's our responsibility in a storm? What's our part in all of this? We're going to see five things from our text. Here's the first one, endure. What do I do in a storm? Start here, endure. Endure. Look at verse 27. Acts chapter 27, verse 27, Luke writes, When the fourteenth night had come, so fourteen days had passed since they tried to lower their anchors at Clauda. Fourteen days of fighting the wind and the waves. Fourteen days and the storm was showing no signs of weakening. Their boat was still being driven along. Back to verse 27. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, Uh, Adriatic Sea is not to be confused with today's Adriatic Sea, which is located between Italy and Croatia. 
In Paul's day, the Adriatic Sea, also known as the Gulf of Adria, uh, this was a spot located about 900 miles south of our modern-day Adriatic Sea. The Gulf of Adria was a spot in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It was in between the islands of Crete and Malta. Uh, This was an open body of water. It was some 500 square miles of water. Now, I want you to think about this. Back in verse 20... We're told that neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. Now, in Paul's day, sailors would use the sun and the stars to navigate. They they, they didn't have any GPS systems then. They used the sky, and this storm blocked out the sun and stars for many days. So they're, they're being blown further and further southwest out into the Gulf of Adria, 500 square miles of water with no way to navigate, no way to get their bearings. They have no clue where they're at at this point. I mean, they're, they're, they're somewhere in the middle of the Mediterranean. Back to verse 27. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. They suspected this because even though they couldn't see land, they were still able to hear waves crashing on the shore. Which the land they were nearing, we're going to learn, it's the island of Malta. Again, it had been 14 days since they tried to put down anchor near the island of Clauda. Fourteen days it took for the storm to blow them west to the island of Malta. James Smith, he's a a British author. He lived in the 19th century. And uh, he did a a very thorough study of Paul's journey to Rome. He, He actually wrote a book called The Voyage and Shipwreck of Paul. And in the book, he talks about how the distance from Clauda to Malta was about 475 miles. Smith says that maritime experts have calculated that for a ship the size of the one Paul was on... Now remember, Paul was on an imperial grain ship. This was a larger vessel. So for a ship of that size to be caught in a nor'easter, the ship would drift about 36 miles a day. And so a ship uh, that large, at that drift rate, to cover 475 miles, it would take about 14 days to go from Clauda to Malta. And so we, we see how accurate the Bible is. Again, verse 27 says that when the what? 14th night had come. It was right around midnight. James Smith says maritime experts have calculated that if Paul's ship left the island of Clauda sometime in the evening, it would reach Malta by midnight on the 14th day. And what's even more interesting is the bay that Paul and the crew uh, are going to wash up on, on Malta. You know what this bay is is called today? St. Paul's Bay, for obvious reasons. So let me just ask you this. What we're reading this morning from Acts 27, is it accurate? Is it true? Did it really happen? Yes! This isn't a make-believe fable. This isn't a a a once-upon-a-time fairy tale. This is true. True, recorded by an eyewitness Luke who wrote all of this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit whom John 14 describes as the spirit of truth. So you can be confident that the passage we're studying in our Bible today and the passages we study every Sunday, you can be confident that it's true. You see, I love, I love that we are a church that preaches the truth. Word for word, line by line, verse by verse, page by page. I mean, if that fires you up, say amen. Okay? If you want to know more truth, say keep going. I will. I appreciate the invitation. Look at verse 28. So they, the crew, took a sounding. They took a sounding. Remember, they suspected they were nearing land, so to make sure, they took a sounding. In other words, they measured how deep the water was by using a rope that was cut to a specific length. This rope had a weight tied to the end of it. They took a sounding, verse 28, and found 20 fathoms. So a fathom was 6 feet. 20 fathoms would be 120 feet. That's how deep the water was. But 20 fathoms soon became 15 fathoms. Uh, The second part of verse 28, look at that. 
It says a little further on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. So how deep is the water now? 15 times 6 equals? Okay, the three of you are correct. I, and it's early for math, so just stay with me here. Were, listen, were the crew's suspicions correct? Were they nearing land? Yes, they were. And so now, think of this, now their initial fear of being lost at sea, that was replaced by the new fear of being smashed on the rocks. Look at verse 29. In fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern. So they did this to try to keep the ship in place, to keep the ship from drifting closer and closer to the rocky shoreline. The crew let down four anchors from the stern, and, and look at the end of verse 29. They prayed for day to come. You know, running aground at midnight in the pitch black during a storm, the, the sailors would like to avoid that if they could. So after they let down their anchors, they prayed to whatever gods they worshipped. They, they prayed for daylight. However, these sailors apparently didn't, didn't fully trust their gods, and so they were seeking to escape. Look at verse 30. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. All right, so let me just explain. In verse 29, the crew already put anchors near the stern of the boat, near, near the backside. Now they say they're going to put even more anchors near the bow, the, the front of the boat. To do this, they would have to take their little lifeboat and row the anchors out away from the ship. Tell me, were these sailors taking the lifeboat to put out more anchors? No, Luke says that they did this under the pretense of laying out more anchors. These little sneaks the sailors were going to row the lifeboat to shore and leave everybody else on the ship. Adversity can bring out the best in mankind and it can bring out the worst in mankind. In this case, we see mankind at his worst. In what can only be described as an act of pure selfishness, the crew tried to take the easy way out. They looked for the nearest exit. They wanted off the boat. So let me just ask you, what do storms reveal about you? When difficulty comes, when trouble strikes, like these sailors, do you flee? Do you leave? Do you want out? Sadly, I can give you name after name of person after person who when the going got tough, they got going. They walked away from their commitment. Now, before the trouble, they were on board. They were all in. They were excited about Jesus, about his church, about his word, about their faith. They were in fuego. But then came the storms of life, trials, suffering, hardship, and they think, you know, I thought things were supposed to be easier after believing in Jesus. Jesus, you're not holding up to your end of the deal. Remember, guys, last week I, I promised, or I said that Jesus promised us eternal life when we believe in him, not an easy life. And the one who values an easy life over eternal life, as soon as life gets hard, he thinks, this is not what I signed up for, I'm out. I'm gone. All right, just let's have a little bit of honesty in church this morning. How many of you have ever felt like taking off? Right? How many of you, when things got dark in your life, how many of you have been like these sailors in Acts 27? You had one foot in the lifeboat, ready to row away and never look back. You ever want to call it quits on Jesus, on the church, on the faith? Listen, if you're truly one of God's kids, and I've said this before, let this wash over you. If you're truly one of God's kids, you may try to let go of him, but he's not letting go of you. And you may even stray a little bit. You may be in the lifeboat halfway to shore. Listen, if you're God's son or daughter, he's going to go after you and bring you back. The book of Hebrews says that God disciplines those he loves. God disciplines those he, he calls his sons and daughters. Somebody once said, all God's kids are getting it. All God's kids are getting it. If you walk away, if you're one of his kids and you walk away, God will discipline you and bring you back. 
But you know, the one, the one who walks away and God does nothing, the one who walks away and stays away, they're not part of the family. And if you think I'm cruel for saying that, the Bible says that. 1 John 2.19, the Apostle John says, those who went out from us, they were not one of us. For if they had been one of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become clear that they're not one of us. And then Jesus said in John 8.31, if you abide in me, you truly are my disciples. See, guys, proof you're saved, it's in your staying power. Those who who truly believe, they will abide, remain, continue, endure to the end. A faith that fizzles before the finish line shows that it was flawed from the start. See, the genuine believer doesn't follow Jesus only when life is easy. The genuine believer follows Jesus even when life isn't easy because Jesus is worth it to him. Jesus is worth loving and following with no strings attached. So when the going gets tough, what should I do? Stick around. Stay put. When the storm strikes, what should I do? Endure, abide, continue. Like the Apostle John said, if you're truly one of us, you'll continue with us. Which, let me ask you, does John know what he's talking about? Is John familiar with enduring storms? All right, check this. The Romans Romans tried to boil John alive in oil. And when John was literally in the pot, he preached a sermon. Then he was forced to drink poison, but he survived that and went right back to his church in Ephesus and continued to preach. All the Romans could do at that point was exile him to the island of Patmos, and it was on Patmos where John wrote the book of Revelation. Does John know about endurance? Yes, John, he he remained, he continued He was a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, and genuine followers of Jesus Christ are with him to the end. It's what Christians do. You know, Paul was that way. The Romans tried to silence Paul. He was like, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like, what do you do with a guy like Paul? Hey, if you let me live, I'm going to continue making my life about Jesus. If you kill me, that'll be even better. What do you do with a guy like that? If I live, my life will exalt Jesus. If I die, my death will exalt Jesus. Tell me, was Paul in it to the end? Absolutely. Again, it's what Christians do. They endure. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. Our second responsibility in a storm. Obey. Obey. So let's, let's get back to our text. The sailors are trying to escape. They have their little plan with the lifeboat and the, the anchors. And at this time, you know, Paul, he's seen it all. And Paul's been all over the world. He, he knows that nothing good lives in mankind's sin nature. So Paul knew what the sailors were up to. He says to the centurion, look at verse 31. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Snitches get... <laughs> was Paul a snitch? Well, yeah, but not really. I, I'm back in verse 24, God promised Paul that all on board the ship would be saved. But in order for that to happen, they all needed to stay together. See, Paul knew that if they were going to make it to shore alive, they would need the sailors. Guys, please don't miss this. God's promise does not negate human responsibility. In other words, like like I said at the beginning, God does his part. God will do what only he can do, but we play a part as well. We're, We're not the star player by any means. That's God, but we do play a role. We do have a small part. The crew's responsibility on this boat, their part was to stay put and stick together. And so when Paul sees the sailors about to shirk their responsibility and in doing so forfeit the promise and jeopardize their lives, he tells the captain and the soldiers, unless these men stay on the ship, unless we all stay together, we cannot be saved. So here's the promise. All will be saved, 
But here's the condition. All have to stay. In other words, obedience is a necessity for some promises to become a reality. You need to know that. Obedience is a necessity for some promises to become a reality. And so Paul sees the sailors about to disobey. He sees the sailors starting to bail in the little lifeboat. Paul knowing they will die if they go through with it. He steps up and he says, in order to be saved, we got to stay put. we got to stick together. Notice the response, verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the lifeboat and let it go. I'm not sure if that's what Paul had in mind, but they obeyed. Right, didn't they? They listened and obeyed to the point where they tossed the lifeboat into the open sea so that they wouldn't even be tempted to leave. So again, let me ask you, how obedient are you? How obedient are you? Is your obedience immediate? Do you obey right away? Delayed obedience, that's not what we're going for. Is your obedience total? Do you obey all the way? Partial obedience, that's not what we're going for. How obedient are you? You know, some of us can, can talk a big game. Some of us can spout off a whole lot of Bible. Some of us can talk theology. But how much of your talk is showing up in your walk? How much of what you know is, is showing up in how you live? You know, the Apostle Peter, that guy could talk a big game. I got a book in my office, gives Peter the nickname, the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. <laughs> Peter could talk. Remember what Jesus said to Peter in the upper room? He said, this very night, you will deny me three times. Peter was like, deny you? Deny you? Never, Lord. I'll die for you before I deny you. Talk, talk, talk. Talk is cheap because what Peter said, it didn't show up in his life. What did Peter end up doing? Denying the Lord. How many times? Three times. Listen to this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. Do you guys understand? It's not your saying. Again, talk is cheap, and some of us can talk. It's not your saying. It's your obeying. You're doing. James chapter 1, verse 22 says that, that if you think it's enough to just hear the word, but you don't do what it says, you're, you're what? You're, you're deceiving yourself. The word deceive in that first means to miscalculate. Professing Christians who make it a habit to hear the word without obeying it, they, they could be making a serious miscalculation about their faith. They're deceiving themselves. John MacArthur says, and, and this, is, this is hard, but it's true, he says any response to the gospel that does not include obedience is self-deception. If a profession of faith in Christ does not result in a changed life that hungers and thirsts for God's word and desires to obey that word, that profession is just that, a mere profession. The devil loves such professions because they give the church member the damning notion that he is saved when he is not. That's as serious as serious gets. You know, maybe you're here this morning and, and you're somebody who enjoys reading and studying the Bible. That's something you like to do. Listen, if you love to read it, but you don't obey it, the Bible's only an affection for you. Maybe you're somebody who likes to collect Bibles. I love getting new Bibles. And maybe you got multiple copies, multiple versions, hardback, leather, goat skin, calf skin, slim line, wide margin, large print, small print. You got all these Bibles displayed on your bookshelf and your coffee table and on the back of your toilet. Listen, if you like to collect Bibles for display purposes only, the Bible's only a decoration to you. 
Maybe you're somebody who loves to listen to other people teach the Bible. You listen to podcasts every day of the week. You love to come to church and sit under the preaching of God's word. But guys, if all you're listening makes no difference in your living, if you observe but never obey, then I object because the Bible's only a deception to you. Again, how's your obedience? The captain and the soldiers, you know, they got a word from the Lord, from Paul. The word was to be saved, stay together on the ship. Their response, they got rid of their life raft completely so that they wouldn't even be tempted to disobey. Immediate, total obedience. So I just got to share with you how I'm failing at this. This past week, I finished uh, reading 1 Samuel 25 in my quiet time, and 1 Samuel 25 is the story of a selfish man named Nabal married to an incredible woman named Abigail. And Nabal only ever took for himself. Take, take, take. That's what Nabal was about. The Bible calls him a fool. And uh, Nabal, uh, at the end, he, he ends up having a stroke. And after a week of being in a coma, he dies. And, you know, David steps in and marries Abigail. Which, by the way, David was already married when he got with Abigail. Not okay. Not okay. First Samuel 25, verse 39 says, Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. Verse 40, When the servants of David came to Abigail, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And guys, as I was, I was reading that, I thought to myself, poor Abigail. She went from one selfish man, Nabal, who took for himself to another selfish man, David who took for himself. And guys, that so convicted me of my selfishness. When I read that, I, I asked myself, am I just another selfish man in a long line of selfish men? See, I, I want to buck the system. I want to break the cycle. I don't want to continue being selfish toward my wife. I don't want to take for myself. I want to give of myself. And I was just so convicted this past week by what I read and what I studied in 1 Samuel 25. And guys, I kid you not, an hour after reading 1 Samuel 25, not even, not even an hour, I was getting ready to head out for work. Carrie asked if I could put air in the tires of her car. The light had been on for a few days, so Carrie was like, can you please put air in the tire? And I said, Carrie, I gotta go. I don't have time for this. I got places to be. Now, I just read about a selfish man married to an incredible woman. I was like, Carrie, Carrie, stay true to her role, incredible woman. I stay true to mine. Selfish husband. Guys, I'm getting ready to back out of my driveway. The Holy Spirit cut me straight to the heart, stopped me dead in my tracks. I couldn't leave without obeying. I couldn't leave without making sure all four tires had enough air. It was cold. My fingers froze, even more so than my cold heart. But guys, I had to obey. God's word stopped me dead in my tracks, and I had to obey. It was delayed obedience, right? I had to confess that to God, and, but then I made it right, and I obeyed. Guys, this is, this is another thing that genuine Christians do. See, not only do they endure, they also obey they submit their lives to the authority of God's word and they live in obedience to it. They don't do this perfectly, but they do it increasingly. So is the Bible your authority? Is the Bible your first and final authority? Not if you don't obey it. If the Bible can stop you dead in your tracks and get you to reverse course, change direction, that's it. That's what we're going for, and that's our responsibility in a storm. God does his part. What's our part? Well, we endure, we obey, and then this, number three, uh, refresh. Endure, obey, refresh. In a prolonged storm, during a, a, an extended season of difficulty, make sure, listen to me, make sure you're staying refreshed. Notice this in verse 33. Uh, as day was about to dawn, so how many days will this be? Okay, well, I mean, it's 14, 15, two full weeks in a storm. 
And so as the, the day was about to dawn, verse 33, check this, Paul urged them to take some food, refreshment. He said, today is the 14th day that you have, so it's the 14th day, not the 15th. We see it right there. Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense. So let me just ask you this. How much sleep does a person get if that person is continuing in suspense? How much sleep? Zero. So no rest. No rest. That's not all. Back to verse 33. Paul says, today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and Without food, having taken nothing. So, no rest, no food for two weeks. Guys, no sleep and no eat. What effect is that going to have on a person who's going through a storm? Yeah. Years ago, I was counseling a young man who just found out that his wife was having an affair. And I spent weeks meeting with this individual, and every week I swore he lost 10 more pounds. I mean, he wasn't eating, he wasn't sleeping, no sleep and no eat. Did that, did that help or hurt in this situation? It made things so much worse. He, was, he wasn't taking care of himself. You know, Elijah, the, really the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, right after his incredible victory over the prophets of Baal, that guy fell into a deep depression. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel wanted him dead. They were hunting him down, and Elijah ran and ran and ran. First Kings 19.5 says that he collapsed under a broom tree. And the guy was in a storm, exhausted, depressed, and, and you know the first thing God did for him? Did God give Elijah a promise? Did God give Elijah a sermon? No, he gave Elijah a meal. God said to him, arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. See, when you're in a storm, part of your responsibility is to eat, sleep, rest, refresh. We like this point, don't we? You know, the part about obeying, we're like, all right, all right. The part about enduring, we're like, yeah, okay, fine. But this point, refresh, eat, sleep, we're like, that's it. Finally, something we can do. But guys, listen, this point is so important because to endure, remember that's our first point, to endure, you gotta have energy, don't you? To have energy, you gotta eat, you gotta rest. Without rest, without refreshment, you will get to a bad place in a hurry. The crew on Paul's boat were in a bad place. Back in verse 20, it says that they abandoned all hope of being saved. These people were flat out depressed. And Paul's like, how long has it been since you've eaten? Here, have a Snickers. You're not you when you're hungry. Right now, I got this idea of this image of Betty White playing football. All right, that's a Snickers commercial. Okay, look it up after the service, by the way. It's a good one. Paul says to the crew, I urge you, look at verse 34, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. Go figure. Take some food, it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. So God's part, not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. The crew's part, take some food. In a storm, we need to make sure we're doing what we can to take care of ourselves physically. And what we can do for ourselves in a storm is, you know, just make sure we're eating and resting. Make sure we're giving our bodies the things it needs for strength and nourishment. Here's something else that's on us. Point number four, gratitude. Gratitude. Look at verse 35. Luke writes, And when Paul had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged. I love that. The fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty, the anger, the doubt, the hopelessness, it all went away. Verse 36 says that they were all encouraged. All. All means everyone. Spent a lot of time studying that this week. All means everyone, and encouraged means cheerful. They all cheered right up. The hopeless sailors who just moments before were ready to bail in the lifeboat, they were now encouraged by Paul giving thanks to God. 
The soldiers who were mad at the sailors for trying to bail in the lifeboat, they were now encouraged by Paul giving thanks to God. The captain who was exhausted from standing at his post for 14 days, he was now encouraged by Paul giving thanks to God. The other prisoners who were terrified of sinking with their arms and legs still in chains, they were now encouraged by Paul giving thanks to God. Gratitude changes everything. James McDonald once said, gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for living. John Phillips, in his commentary on Acts, he says this, a new spirit of optimism prevailed. A buzz of conversation arose. People began to peer through the gloom with new heart and new hope. Paul's promise of safety somehow seemed more real. This was all put in motion by a simple prayer of thanksgiving. A simple prayer of thanksgiving. Philippians 4, 6, a very familiar verse of Scripture, one that we've turned to in our storms. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guys, to get peace in a storm, right? To get peace in a storm, worry about nothing, pray about everything, and in our prayers, we must include supplication with thanksgiving. So let me just explain here. Supplication is you getting specific with God about what you need. We all got something we need. Bring it to God and be specific, but it's not just supplication. It's supplication with thanksgiving. We forget that. So, guys, it's not just you in your prayer giving God a to-do list. God, here's what I need you to do for me. It's also you writing out a list of all the things God's already done that you're so thankful for. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you filled up your whole prayer with thanksgiving? Instead of, God, I need, I want. No, it's God, thank you. Thank you. Two weeks ago, I was laying in bed. I could not shut my brain off. I was just overwhelmed with everything I had going on. And, you know, instead of grabbing for my phone, like I usually do, instead of grabbing for my phone, I rolled over, closed my eyes, and I just started going through the the list of all the good things that God's given me and done for me, and I thanked him. And as I did that, I fell right asleep. See, Philippians 4, 6 is true. When we present our request to God with thanksgiving, the peace of God guards our hearts or our emotions, and it guards our minds or our thinking. God's peace that comes through gratitude, it keeps us in check, okay? It keeps our feelings in check, and it keeps our thoughts in check. Now, if you need help with a list, a gratitude checklist, you can start with these three things. Number one, thank God for his plan. Thank God for his plan, his plan to use everything that happens in our lives for our ultimate good, Romans 8, 28. You got a better plan than God's? Yeah, absolutely not. Thank God for his plan. And thank God for his power. Thank God for his power. Guys, not just any power. God's all power. You know, there's some some situations that happen in our life that we cannot handle. You ever hear people say, well, God God will never give you more than you can handle. You ever hear that? That's a lie. That is a lie. There are some situations that we can't handle, and I know that's hard for us us control freaks to hear, but it's true. There are times when we are in way over our head, but there's nothing that God can't handle because he has unlimited power. And 1 Peter 1.5 says that we are being guarded by that power. Thank him for that. Lord, I'm going through something right now, and it it is way too much for me, but it's not too much for you, and your power in me is what makes me strong when I am weak, so thank you. Thank God for his plan, thank God for his power, and thank God for his promises. Thank God for his promises. I actually have many of God's promises written down 
on three by five cards. I'll just share a few of them with you. Here's my top five. The top five promises straight from the mouth of God. Number one, Deuteronomy 31.6. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed for it is I, the Lord your God, who goes with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. In other words, God is always with me. Number two, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, plans to give you a hope and a future. In other words, God is always good. Number three, Isaiah 43, 1, but now, thus says the Lord who created you, who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. In other words, God always loves me. Number four, Isaiah 43, 2. God says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame will not consume you. In other words, God is always in control. And then number five, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. In other words, God always wins. Now, those are some awesome promises. And of course, we know that a promise is only as good as the person who makes it. And so a lot of times when we say, I promise, what we really mean is, I'll try, or I really hope so, or we'll see, but not God. Joshua 24, 15 says, not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. How many of God's promises are a fail? Not one. Thank him for that. Thank him for his plan, his power, and his promises. So, guys, listen, this is what we can do right here, right now, in whatever storm we're facing. These are the things we can do. Endure, obey, refresh, gratitude. And number five, I'm going to get through this quick, fellowship. Fellowship. Notice the fellowship in this text. Look at verses 36 and 37. It says, Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. Guys, they weren't alone. They had each other. They were all encouraged. They all ate food. They were in all 276 persons. We don't see the singular pronouns, me, myself, I, you, he, she. We see the plural pronoun, all. So here's the thing about being hopeless and depressed in a storm. And I can say this because I know this from personal experience. You isolate yourself, and then you tell yourself, I'm all alone because no one cares, no one understands, no one gets me. I have said to Carrie more than once, more than once in a storm, I feel so alone. I feel so alone. Carrie's always like, well, have you talked to anybody? No, nobody cares. Am I alone? No. You know, Elijah wasn't alone, but he thought he was. So Elijah, after he strengthened himself with food under the broom tree, he decides to isolate himself even more. And so he gets up from under the tree and he climbs up a mountain and he he tucks himself away in a cave. Once again, God shows up and he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah says, I have been very zealous for you, Lord, and yet people are seeking to kill me. I, only I am left, and they seek my life and take it away. See, Elijah is telling himself, it's only me. I'm all alone. No one cares. And I love what God says. He says to Elijah, why don't you leave the cave and go back to Jerusalem? There you will find 7,000 people who love me and love you. Elijah isolated himself and then convinced himself that nobody cared. Well, there were a lot who cared. He just needed to get off the mountain. He needed to get out of the cave and go be with people. Listen to me. This church loves you. This church cares for you. This church wants to serve you and pray with you and help you. But you need to get off your mountain. 
You need to climb out of your cave. Stop isolating yourself. Stop, stop throwing pity parties where you're the only person invited. Table for one, no more of that. Paul had a whole crew on his boat. You need a crew. We want to be your crew. But you got to let us on board. Lower the ramp and let us on. Fellowship is something we need to seek out and pursue, especially during a storm. Real quick, look at verse 38. It says, And when the crew had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. So notice these guys did what they could. They did what they could. They, the plan was to run the ship aground. Back in verse 26, Paul says, uh, but we must run aground on some island. They were, they were approaching the island, Malta, and so their boat needed to ride higher in the water in order to go further up the beach. And for that to happen, they didn't just hold hands on the deck and sing Kumbaya. No, they got to work. They, they began dumping the rest of the grain to lighten the ship so it could ride higher in the water, so it could run aground further up the beach. They made an effort. They got to work. They did their best and trusted God with the rest. All that to say this, guys, do what you can. God will do what only he can do. God will do more than his fair share. God will meet you more than halfway, but there's a little bit you can do. Five things, endure, obey, refresh, gratitude, and fellowship. All right, let's leave no butt prints in the sand. All right, let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we thank you for how faithful you are in your word. God, you fed us once again this morning. Thank you for being so clear about what we can do in a storm. God, we know that you will do your work. You will do what you desire. But there's a little bit we can do. We need to endure. We need to remain. We need to continue. God, help us. Help us to do that. God, we need to obey we need to actually take what we've heard this morning and live it out. So, Lord, would you help us do that? God, we need to make sure that we are taking care of our physical bodies. You know what we need. You meet our needs. God, may we be healthy. May we do the things that we need to do for rest, for refreshment. Part of that refreshment is just being together on a Sunday worshiping you. That gives us rest. God, we need fellowship. We need one another. I thank you for this body. I thank you for our time together. I thank you for our Wednesday nights. I thank you for our life groups. Thank you for the reminder that we're not alone. Not only are you with us, but you have given us so many wonderful people to shoulder the journey with. And God, ultimately, may we go through life praising you, giving you thanks for everything that you do, for everything you are. May we be anxious about nothing. May we pray about everything. Supplication with thanksgiving. God, thank you again for speaking to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.